good afternoon everybody this will be the last installment of the masterclass with me at least with me and we kind of want to tie in everything that we've done so far in the class so if you follow us along the journey we would have started off with you know jamstock x how to actually utilize the website we then went into reading financial statements you know in, um, your income statement your balance sheet your cash flow statement we then went into actually analyzing the equity what are the different valuation techniques you can use to value a company based on you know what type of company it is we then went into fixed income looked at what type of fixed income securities there are you know what type of um yields there are on a bond those type of things so this final class is actually going to be about portfolio construction now the reason why portfolio i decided to end the, this series on portfolio is because at the end of the day you need to now be able to compile everything together to create a portfolio for yourself for your clients companies have portfolios and portfolio construction is a very important aspect when you're speaking about um developing investment strategies for individuals so in this week we're going to focus on what is a risk profile and identifying risk profiles what is a portfolio and its components then at the end of the class like every other class we're going to do a demonstration where we're going to actually construct a portfolio for a different set of clients. All right, you guys online following me? You guys are seeing the presentation? Yes, they are. All right, cool. So let's start by the big question, what is a risk profile? And I will take this time to say, a lot of people really don't understand what a risk profile is. Persons overlook what a risk profile is. People don't even take into consideration what a risk profile is when they're speaking about investing. And that's something that at Barita for sure, we're not going to fall into that trap. The COVID-19 as a pandemic kind of showed you why it's important to understand your risk profile. And we're going to ensure that we emphasize this whenever we're speaking about a client, whenever we're thinking about a portfolio. First thing that should come to your mind, what is the risk profile of a person? So risk profile has multiple definitions. A risk profile is an evaluation of an individual's willingness and ability to take risk. Now I highlighted willingness and ability because these are two items that are going to be the foundation of any risk profile. We get into details of what each R is, but we're going to essentially have a building block on top of these two attributes, willingness and ability. So you need to remember these two um, keywords. Then a risk profile identifies the acceptable level of risk an individual is prepared, highlighted prepared, and able to accept. No, risk is not bad. That's the first thing we want to dispel. No, after this meeting, nobody should be able to think, you know, risk that sounds too risky. Risk is not bad. Risk management is important. So risk profile, so risk itself is not bad. Risk management is very important because the way that risk works is that you get rewarded for the amount of risk that you take. If you take no risk, you can get no reward. If you take a lot of risk, you can, emphasis on the word, can get a lot of reward. There's no guarantee. It's not a linear function. It doesn't mean that for every ounce of risk you take, you just use the word ounce, or every metric of risk you take, you get a met metric of reward. That is not how, in reality, the equities market, fixed income market, or investing in general works. But you need to ensure that any risk that you're taking, you are comfortable with that level of risk, and you're also comfortable with the reward that you're getting. So a risk profile can be associated to an individual, an organization, and a portfolio. Now, it's important to emphasize that portfolio itself can have a risk profile because, again, you will have what Jack Barita has, a collective investment scheme, which are unit trusts. Each unit trust has a risk profile categorization. Hence, if a person doesn't fit this risk profile, they should not participate in this fund. And, that's, and that is a function of the person's own individual risk profile, separate from the portfolio's risk profile. So again, these three items, these three individuals, the organization can be viewed as an individual, has their own separate risk profile. And it's important as, a, as an advisor, as an analyst, or anybody speaking about investing, that you ensure that the risk profiles are matched. You don't want somebody who's really risky in a low risk product. At that point in time, they're willing to take more risk and they're not being rewarded for it, or you're under you're under allocating them per se to a particular investment security. You don't want someone that is very low risk and you have them exposed to whole heap of fancy things because they're not gonna understand them, they get nervous, they get panic because they did not understand the risk. So that is why it's important to have the appropriate risk assignment. The risk profile can be determined by performing a questionnaire that essentially scores a person's 
quantitative and qualitative components. Quantitative speaks about actual numbers. So what is your income? What is your monthly salary? You know, how much savings do you have? Do you have debt? Those are the quantitative stuff. Qualitative means do you have anybody depending on you? Do you have any um are you dependent on anybody else? You know, what are your circumstances? So there's a number aspect to it, which is the quantitative aspect, but there's a qualitative aspect as well. You actually have to get to know the person. You're building a portfolio for somebody. This is Hotton's portfolio. Nobody else can jump on Hotton's portfolio. This fits my risk profile. This is what suits me. And I always emphasize to people, when somebody asks you, yo, what should I buy? You know, is this a good buy? The first thing you should respond to them is that, what is your risk profile? Because you need to know What's good for me is not necessarily good for you. And that's how you have to operate every single time. Not because you see this going up means that the person should buy it. Not because it's going down means that it's necessarily bad. You have to always ensure that you have that conversation. What is your risk profile? The risk profile acts as a guide to all financial decisions made by companies and individuals. Now, this last part is very important, especially in the context that where, for example, your risk profile is low. But you see in the equities market, there's a large rally, 30% going up. Would you then go and put that person in the equities market? No, because that is not their risk profile. And you have to always ensure not to be tempted. Now, we're not going to go into detail for this particular class, but there's something called an enterprise risk management framework, which essentially determines the parameters which the risks are taken for an organizational level. So the organization sets these parameters to say, these are the risks that we're going to take. Even if there's a reward at the end of it, if we take on more risk, we're not going to go to that level because we have our strict framework that we're going to abide to. And that is essential what the ERM framework is, and that's what Barita operates as well. We have strict frameworks for our risk, and this is how we need to apply it to our clients as well. This is your risk profile. You have to stick to it. If it and um, we're going to go into further to say that the risk profiles can change, but why they change is very important. So... I developed a quick questionnaire. This is not exhaustive, but the questionnaire is really to um, must be clear, must be direct, must be intrusive to ensure that the appropriate scores are assigned to an individual. So don't be afraid to ask a person, boy, you know, someone don't really want to get too much of their personal business. You have to get personal because you're making an investment decision for them. So you need to know what is their financial situation. Do you have any dependents? What is your investment horizon? What are your investment goals? You know, are you saving for a home? Are you looking to buy a car? Um, are you employed or self-employed? What is your source of income? Where do you reside or operate? And where do you pay taxes? These are very important questions. Um, what is your level of knowledge about the market? Are you willing to lose money to make money? These are questions that you have to ask persons. And again, this is not exhaustive. These are just a small sample case. But to be able to develop a portfolio for a person, you need to know these answers because again, you want to ensure the current risk profiles are assigned to a person, right? So we're going to look at what makes up a risk profile for a person. Now I made mention to two terms earlier, willingness and ability. So the foundations of a risk profile is really hinged on these two items. Willingness to take risk refers to an individual's risk aversion, or in a simpler word, I like to use high level words because we believe we should be speaking at that level. Risk aversion refers to, am I comfortable with this type of risk? Am I a risky person? Am I a risk taker? Now a risk taker is the opposite of a risk averse person. Risk averse means say, I don't want to take a lot of risk. I'd rather stay away from that. A risk taker means that give me all the risk. I will take it. I know what's at stake. So a person's willingness is essentially them saying, I am willing to or I'm, a I'm willing to take on more risk or I'm willing to take on less risk. I understand what I am investing in. I am willing to take that risk or not. Ability though, ability refers to evaluates a person's actual ability or reviews their individual assets and liabilities. No. I may be willing to take on the risk of a bond, but bonds are expensive. Hence, I may not be able to take that risk. So that's why these things go hand in hand. Anybody can take on risk, especially when you come on to borrowing and margin. If I borrow the money, I'm lost the money. I'm not buying money. I don't care. Right? So some people may be willing to take on risk, but they may not be able to afford it. Hence, you have to look at a person's assets and liabilities. Because a person who is highly indebted, as much as the risk they want to take, maybe they're not necessarily able, because last class we went into debt capacity. 
right? We're looking at fixed income securities. We're looking at the capacity of a borrower. Hence, if somebody's capacity is high or low in this case, if the capacity is low, I mean that they don't have much room for any more debt. Hence, you will not necessarily lend that person. So even though their risk, their willingness is high, you know, they really may not be able to necessarily take on the kind of risk that they want to take on. Hence, they have to do debt restructuring, etc. So these are the two fundamental aspects that really build into a person's risk profile. Now, these are these questions or these answers are found through the questionnaire. You know, so when you talk about willingness, you're talking about what kind of knowledge do you have of the market. That question will go into willingness. The answer ability, what is your source of income? or what is your level of income that goes into ability so each question i'm going to go back each question answers a different or answers a different part of the risk profile whether it be in ability whether it be in willingness but you need to get to understanding so truthfully the way that the risk profile the risk quarantine the questionnaire works is that you'd actually develop a score for that person and then they will be assigned. That's how it's really done on a technical basis. But even from a conversation, you can know how a person feels about taking risk. You know, them sound kind of iffy when you mention something, they're not really sure. Then naturally you know that, okay, then maybe this is not the ideal product for that person. So this is why it's very important you have that relationship with your clients or with anybody you're going to be creating a portfolio for. So an individual's willingness is mainly qualitative and is based on multiple elements such as age, financial knowledge, investment horizon, their home situation, um, referring to like dependence and um, if there's anybody depending on them or they depend on anybody else. And an individual's ability is mainly quantitative and is based on their financial standing. So sources of income, expenses, their debts. These are the how you treat willingness and ability. Our risk profile is not complete unless the willingness and ability of an individual is fully understood and documented. I highlighted this last part, documented, because we've all seen before where a person will say that their risk profile, yeah, mama can take on a risk. And then something go bad, boy, you know, say, you know, wicked though, you know, put me up in this and you never tell me. No, sir, here's the documentation. You sign to this level of risk. No, that doesn't mean that you should let somebody, you know, take on risk that even if they say or the risk profile says this, you know, you really need to have that conversation with the person. You should let them know what they're invested in. No client should ever be unaware of what exactly they're investing in is comprised of, whether that be in the unit trust or whether that be in a particular portfolio construction. If you're building a portfolio for a client, you should tell them that, okay, I put this amount in this kind of bonds. This is what the bond is about. I put these equities, I chose these equities because they should know fully what they're invested in. And then for the case of the, um, the unit trust, we send out a fact sheet every, um, every month where we tell you what the fact sheet is about in terms of what these different funds are about, what these funds are invested in. We show the asset allocation, we show the market exposures. So at no point in time should a client say, yo, I don't know what this fund is about. Mm -hmm. We always ensure that you know what you're investing in. So I emphasize again, the documented is a very important aspect of it. It protects you from liability if a client then they said they did not know you need to always ensure that you document the risk profile is assigned to a client because they're the ones that are going to sign this document to say okay this is my risk profile is true and now an effective tool in this point in time i want to emphasize is barita's roadmap after that questionnaire is complete is assigned a particular um portfolio allocation among our different unit trusts and even at that point it's still not documented this is just an algorithmic um, result that's presented to the client. They then need to come in, speak to our advisor, understand what is going to be involved in these different unit trusts, and then they sign to say, okay, cool, this is the portfolio I'm going to work with. This is the um, risk profile I'm assigned to. And that is how it goes. That's how it should go. And that's what we need to maintain here at Barito. At no point in time should you just randomly tell a person to invest in this or invest in that. You need to know what their risk profile is. Right? Now, there are different types of risk profiles. Now, individual risk profiles can be broken down into three broad themes, which are aggressive, moderate, and conservative. You will have persons that are hybrids of, of each other, but essentially everybody falls into one of these categories. So now, an aggressive person or an aggressive investor tends to be a market savvy. They have a deep understanding of securities and their propensities to allow such an individual or institutional investor to purchase highly volatile instruments such as growth stocks or small company stocks that can plummet to zero. If you go to a, sorry, if you go to a client and say, listen, this stock can go to zero, you know, but it can go to a hundred. Them say, cool, 
that's an aggressive person. They're willing to take that risk because they know that they fully understand that, hey, to get rewarded, you have to take that risk. And again, risk doesn't imply that it has to go bad. That's not what risk is and don't think about risk like that. Essentially, risk is just letting you know that whatever insecurity you're investing in, these are the positive and these are the negatives in a simpler form. These are the realities or the possibilities that may come out of a particular risk profile or out of a particular security, sorry. Then you have the moderate person. A moderate investor accepts some risk to the principal, but adopt a balanced approach with an intermediate term, um, time horizon, anywhere between five to 10 years. So in speaking about, they prefer to buy blue chip equities that are less volatile. They purchase bonds that are credible. They're not going to buy a high yielding bond. They take pretty much riskless securities. Their portfolio um, empirically um, usually is 50-50 towards you know, equities and fixed income, for example. And a typical strategy for this portfolio includes like um, dividend yielding stocks have gross um in the blue chip companies this person portfolios tend to be relatively balanced so they're balanced on the upside and the downside meaning that they're not going to take too much risk but they're taking enough risk to be rewarded or compensated for it so they're not going to go all out like an aggressive nor they're going to be sheltered and afraid like a conservative i don't use the word afraid that's wrong because really and truly there's nothing wrong with being conservative it's just that you don't you're a risk averse that's the appropriate word not afraid but you're risk averse right so a conservative person, which is the last one, is conservative investors are willing to accept little to no volatility or risk in their investment portfolios. These are often retirees who have spent decades building a nest egg of, um, in case of their pensions and are willing to allow any type of risk to their principal. A conservative investor um, targets securities or vehicles that are guaranteed to be highly liquid, meaning that they, can, they need to come for their money, they cannot come for it. There's no long talking. It, something them have a bad dream something happening in a dream they just want to come for their money them come for their money they want very highly liquid securities they're risk averse these risk averse individuals offer things like cds money market securities u.s treasuries um for income and preservation of capital these are what a conservative person invests in typically again there's nothing wrong with being conservative. It's just a risk profile assignment. You're just risk averse. You, there's no shame in even being a young person than risk averse because a young person, if you do not have the level of knowledge to know what you're investing in, you really shouldn't be taking that risk. Hence, there's nothing wrong with being young and risk averse as well as there's nothing with being older and aggressive. You have a lot of experience. You've been in the capital markets for a very long time. You're at the retirement age and now you have the freedom and time to probably sit down behind your laptop and watch the market and you want to be aggressive. There's nothing wrong with that either. So a risk profile does not necessarily assign to a person's age, right? It is important to know that a person's risk profile can change over time as they age or their circumstances changes. For example, if, I, if before my financial situation didn't allow me to take on a certain risk, which is in the case of a bond, but then I win the lotto and I cannot start buy a bond, my risk profile would definitely change at that point in time. In the case of ability, my ability now, I always had the willingness, but I didn't have the ability. Now my ability is there, hence I can now purchasing bonds. But I highlighted this, I think I should have made it its own screen. Their risk profile should not change based on market conditions. Not because everything gone down. Oh my Lord, I'm no longer aggressive. Boy, I'm never plan for this. I'm never I'm know what this be. That should not be the case. Market conditions should not detem determine a person's risk profile. If you buy equity today, and I start going down 20%, you should be like, cool, I can buy some more because it's now 20% cheaper. That is how you should think. That is how a person who's an aggressive risk profile should really be buying. Not because I go down 20%, give me back my money, I don't know what is to put me in, take it back, no. That person was, uh, was not allocated to the appropriate risk profile. And in the case of COVID-19, we saw a lot of that panic happening because persons were just seen in the case of Jamaica, our, our stock exchange has been going up for the majority between 2015 and 2019. Nobody ever saw a down period. So everybody just say, yeah, man, equity are going good. I'm gonna buy some equity. Everybody talking about stocks. Now, COVID-19 came, our stock market fell almost 30%. It's still in bear territory, which is anything that falls by 20%. It's called bear territory. Our stock market is still bear territory. And persons were just deciding that, hey, I don't want to want equity. This is not what I saw happening over the past four years, five years. I don't want anything to do with this type of investment. I am no longer an aggressive investor. That should not be the case. 
if you document that you're um you are an aggressive risk profile you should have known or that advisor should have properly educated you on what exactly our aggressive risk profile means it doesn't mean that you get to dandy shandy along the different risk profile today i'm conservative today i'm moderate tomorrow i'm aggressive no if you feel like you have the inclination to change how you feel about a security maybe you should be more, more, more moderate hence your portfolio will be weighted in a way that allows you to have exposure to security that will not necessarily have a lot of volatility in the case of the equities market maybe you buy some bonds some high some investment grade bonds etc if you're strictly conservative you're sticking in the cds and treasuries if you're aggressive you're buying equities but it doesn't mean that you're only going to buy equities you have high risk bonds that you can buy so at the end of the day Again, there's nothing wrong with transitioning along the risk profile scale, but why you transition is important. If you're transitioning because your willingness has changed or your age or your ability has changed, those are normal circumstances, especially that a person ages. A university graduate may not have a job yet, so they may have the willingness, but not the ability. Somebody who's been working for 10 years may have the ability and the willingness. Then somebody who's about to retire may have the ability, but they may not have the willingness. So again, you move along the risk profile scale, which is not wrong there's nothing wrong with that but what is wrong is when your risk profile change because the market is dull look good right now that should not be the case and hence why i emphasize that you should document what the risk profile a person signed up for to protect yourself against liability because at the end of the day guys when you're making investment advice to people they are giving you a level of trust right you have a fiduciary duty to these persons and at that same in that same case you need to be able to protect yourself from liability because clients when they're upset they will say anything they will say, oh, nobody never tell me nothing. Here's a document. You sign the document, we had the conversation. Here's the email trail. You need to always make sure you have these conversations with these persons, have them documented. Because again, in this period of volatility, like now in the COVID-19 pandemic, everybody is clueless to what they're investing in all of a sudden. Everybody is nervous, not sure. And you need to be able to develop that level of trust with the client and know that, hey, this is what you're investing in. And this is what, um, this fits your risk profile. So this sums up essentially what a risk profile is. Is there any questions in the room or online? No? Okay, so I'm going to move forward into what is a portfolio, right? Now, a portfolio is a grouping of financial assets such as stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies, or its cash equivalents, as well as fund counterparts, including mutual fund, mutual exchange funds, ETFs, and closed-ended funds like the unit trust. All those things can go into a portfolio. There's no limitation to what can be in a portfolio. People actually trade movie films. Those are actually a tradable security. Very illiquid, but it's tradable. People trade lumber, people trade timber, people trade wheat, cows. Those are tradable securities on, on, on overseas <laughs> wheat. I did say wheat. I did say wheat. <laughs> right. These are tradable securities. They have an intrinsic value and can actually go into your portfolio. Some of those are considered to be alternative investments, right? But essentially, anything you can think of can be a part of your investment portfolio. Now, an investment portfolio can be thought of like a pie that is divided into pieces of varying sizes representing a variety of asset classes and or types of investments that accomplish an appropriate risk return portfolio allocation what is this long gibberish saying your risk profile is developed in a way to have a targeted return now if you're a balanced portfolio it may be expecting a, a return anywhere between the ranges of probably say five to ten theoretically if you're conservative, maybe expect anywhere between one to five. If you're aggressive, maybe seek anywhere between 10 to 15. Sorry. So your risk profile is created in a way that allows you to have a particular risk adjusted return. Emphasis on the word risk return because risk has to be taken into consideration. Now, also, I kind of want to um, I want to make the point that when you have a pro um a portfolio portfolio doesn't only mean investment portfolio per se a portfolio refers to a person's financial situation which would have gone into their risk profile so how much assets does this person have cars house or do they only have debts those are some of the things you have to take into consideration when you're speaking about a portfolio now somebody who's highly indebted you know they may be at risk or they may need cash very often hence you have to stay relatively liquid hence that kind of helps you determine that okay maybe in this person case based on how their financial standing is they have some ability because they have the capacity but you don't want to overexpose them to um a particular asset class that you know is not as liquid that they may need it to be 
So a portfolio is made up of individual securities that are combined based on a risk profile. So what does that mean? So when you have uh, individual securities, equities, for example, are considered relatively risky, but you may have a bond that is considered to be lower in risk relative to equity. Hence, when you balance these two things together, you get a hybrid combination between a high risk security and a moderate risk security. And that's kind of how you have to think about creating portfolios. You have to do a little bit of mixing as a painter you know, or a chef. When you have a food, you have to put in the right sauces and seasoning. That's what goes into creating a portfolio with an objective in mind. So a portfolio is created to meet a specific goal stated by the individual when assessing their risk profile, such as a retirement fund, saving towards university, saving to buy a house, could be an emergency fund or a business fund. You know, a lot of young people leave university, they have an idea that they want to explore. Two other friends come together and say, Yo, let's put on some money so in five years time we can act on this idea, you know? So there, has, there are multiple goals, even a vacation fund. People actually do create vacation funds every month or every, every year, put down money into this fund. At the end of every year, maybe every Christmas, every summer, we take a trip somewhere, anywhere in the world. Right? There are multiple goals or different um, objectives that a portfolio can have. Again, this conversation needs to be had. Why are you investing this money? What do you plan to use it for? Is it, you're going to use it for a stream of income? Are you going to use it for vacation, emergency funding? Are you going to buy a house with this money? These are important questions because again, that determines what type of securities go into um, the portfolio. Right, A portfolio can be created for multiple reasons, and the reasons determine what type of portfolio is created. I'll say that again. A portfolio can be created for multiple reasons, and the reason determines what type of portfolio is created. They go hand in hand. You need to know what this person plans to do with the money. Somebody can come to you and say, hey, I have $20 million, build a portfolio for me. If you somebody approaches you like that, you need to say, sir, what do you plan to do with this money? Can I keep it away from you for 20 years and I don't see it again for the lighter day? Or do you need to see it very often in terms of cash flow outwards towards you? You need to ask those questions. It's very inappropriate in a sense when a client just comes and just say, I have $20 million and I wanted to invest it and there's no further conversation. You're exposing yourself because you're not asking the appropriate questions. Once somebody has any extra money they may have laying around, probably they sold a property, probably is inheritance you need to then ask them what do you want to do with this money and guys you need to be asking these questions ask questions ask questions you are not um psychics you cannot know um what a client wants based on whatever reason you need to ask these questions and if a client is uncomfortable with you asking this question then i really don't believe that you should be exposing yourself because again a risk profile needs to be signed it needs to be documented and you need to be able to protect yourself and the company Right? So you need to make sure you ask these questions. Here's some extra money I have, do something with it. What would you like me to do with it? That is a question. You have the right to ask that question. You have to protect yourself. You have to protect your clients. They need to know what they're investing in. So you need to ask these questions. Now, a portfolio generally can be broken up into three different um, themes, but each risk profile can have this theme. Now let me say it again. Our portfolio can be broken up into three distinct themes, but our risk profiles can have each of these themes. So I'll go into it so you can probably understand why I'm saying this. Now, the themes behind a portfolio is really capital appreciation, capital protection, and cash generation. Capital appreciation refers to those assets that are expected to appreciate in value, such as stocks or real estate. Asset prices in terms of housing goes up generally. You hardly ever hear that a property value goes down unless it's some um, severe circumstances. Capital protection refers to assets that are expected to hedge against devaluation, money market securities, private credit investments. Because private credit investments, such as private bonds, are not traded, there's no loss in value for those securities. You're only exposed to the risk that the company just decides not to pay. You know, you take on that kind of risk. A private company, they don't really have to pay, you know, there's no agreement or law forcing them to pay. You just assign the agreement. If they decide not to abide by it, then again, that's the risk that you take. If you remember the last class with the specific to the bond, Raul made very good points. None of us have ever been to Africa. Hence, you really want to give your money to somebody in Africa. You have never been there, don't know anybody down there. You don't know anything about Africa. That would essentially be a bond that you may not necessarily want to invest in if you're not severely aggressive because again you have no idea what's happening down in africa 
Now, when I made a point about our risk profile can take this type of risk, in the case of capital appreciation, not because you're conservative doesn't mean you cannot buy equities. No, the type of equities you buy is important. If you buy, you say, an NCB, there's nothing wrong with buying an NCB stock because at that point in time, it's considered to be blue chip. Hence, a low risk person or a low risk profile person can have equity exposure or capital appreciation exposure. But again, it's the type of asset you're buying. You're not going to have this person buy into, for example, a Lumber Depot, which only have one outlet at a Papine. And you know, it's considered to be relatively high risk. Now, again, you have two equities here I mentioned, NCB and Lumber Depot. They're both equities in terms of asset class, but they're not the same. The risk in each investment is not the same. One is blue chip, one is relatively um, small in that gross um, stock. Capital protection. Everybody wants capital protection. Nobody gets up and say, yeah, I'm going to lose some money today. So even an aggressive risk profile and a conservative risk profile will want some form of capital protection that should naturally be built into any portfolio that is there. So again, risk protection just means naturally you want to buy money market securities. The yield or their returns are very small, but you'll hardly find a, a money market security that really goes down because again, they're invested in very um, high rated stocks, um, high rated bonds or securities that would not really lose value over time. Then you want cash generation. You essentially want your portfolio to feed itself. You want that the, the portfolio is, becomes a living organism. It takes care of itself. You buy some bonds, the dividends, the um, coupons come in, you reinvest the coupon, buy some more bonds, bond price go up, buy some dividends. And at that point in time, just watch your money work for you, which is what Barrett is all about. You just literally just watch your money work. You don't have to do anything else because your portfolio is constructed in such a way that it becomes a living organism in its own self and it generates enough cash to take care of itself. Also, it can generate a portfolio that it can even pay for its own mortgage. You have a mortgage, you create a portfolio, you then take the coupons from that portfolio, not affecting your principal, and use that coupon to pay for your mortgage every month. So at no point in time are you using any new money, you're only using the money from your portfolio. Your portfolio is literally taking care of you. Your money is literally working for you. These are real life scenarios. I'm not making this up. This is not theoretical. This can actually happen, but you have to make sure that you know how to construct your portfolio. Hey, one question, yeah. So. On our client's agreement form, there's the risk profile there and they take conservative, moderate, mm -hmm. aggressive, and so on. So if someone takes conservative, can they then opt to buy stocks? Or is it that we're to explain to them, if you take conservative, you cannot buy stocks? Okay, so the question was asked, in the case of Barita's client service agreement, if a client takes the word, takes conservative, is it that they then should not buy stocks? or uh, if they're planning to buy stocks, you know, you should have a conversation with them. Again, there's equities as an asset class generally is volatile, yes, and it's considered riskier, but in the case of the scenario I gave a while ago with NCB and Lumber Depot, you just may not necessarily want to put that person in a Lumber Depot, they may buy NCB, or even better, because they're conservative, you may not want them to get direct equity exposure, you may put them in a mutual fund, in the case of a capital growth fund, where a money manager will literally take care of that for you. Right. Although the money, the capital growth fund is considered is a risk is a high risk profile in terms of um, the risk profile assigned to the capital growth fund, your allocation of the capital growth fund kind of determines, you know, is my portfolio risky now or not? And I'll give you a perfect example. We have, you say we have three or we utilize three of our um, of our portfolios, our unit trusts here. We have the capital growth fund, we have the money market fund and the income portfolio fund, right? A client is conservative. What that means for me is that maybe I'll put 80% in our money market fund. I'll probably put 10% in income portfolio or 15% income portfolio. And then the final five, I put in capital growth fund. At that point in time, that mixture, you know, remember in the kitchen, you're cooking, that mixture now reduces the risk exposure to the client because the capital growth fund is such a small component of the portfolio that even though it's, a, it's, a risk, it's aggressive at a risk profile, the portfolio that is capital growth fund, based on how I constructed my portfolio, you know, it doesn't affect or changes my personal risk profile of conservative. Does that help answer the question? Yes, I just wanted to know that they can. Um, that they can they, yeah, so in, um, in truth, they, sh they, sh they should be able to, but again, you know, each company under their own ERM framework will determine if a client can outright not or as such. That's kind of based on the company's individual. But in truth and in theory, there's nothing wrong with it because, again, 
a portfolio where it's only like 5% is very, very small. Hence, the risk is very mitigated relative to everything else. So again, it's really about portfolio construction. It doesn't matter your risk profile, you can participate in all of these different themes, which is capital appreciation, capital protection, and cash generation. I mean, at the end of the day, the only thing that really generates capital appreciation outside of buying a house is really equities or stocks. And if a person is going to invest and not have any stocks, might as well put it in a savings account, right? Just for simplicity. So the question I will ask in the case of um, the example I gave a while ago, where it's 5% in the capital growth fund and the, um, the capital growth fund does well, hence the weighting changes a bit. Does that person, is it no longer conservative? No, the answer to that question, really and truly, you as an advisor, this is where you come in and say, okay, the cap growth has been doing this, um, this amount and you're investing each month, really and truly, you would allocate that person's portfolio in a way that it continues to maintain its conservative approach. So not that because not because the capital growth is doing good means that when the person brings in new money every month, they can only put money in the cap growth. No, you may actually purchase some more money market for the person because you want to maintain that portfolio waiting. So if, uh, for example, they start out with 100,000 and the portfolio goes to 200,000, the weighting of the asset class is in that portfolio does not necessarily have to change even though the nominal value of the portfolio changes is a weighting mechanism so you need to make sure that the weighting is maintained so if capital growth fund goes up by 10 percent then when the person invests you need to ensure that you put in um securities in the, the money into other securities so that the weighting for the capital growth goes back within the parameters which was originally set you get, you get what i'm saying you need to always ensure you maintain that particular weighting so that you ensure that you're maintaining the risk profile of the particular clients and I imagine you want you can rebalance the portfolio as well. So right. If if it increased significantly on that side, you can take some of that excess and Right. So Sean was making a point that this is what you consider to be rebalancing, which is essentially what you really want to be doing in, the, in that particular scenario. You want to rebalance the portfolio for the client so that, you know, you maintain particular weightings. That's what happens even in, um, in the case of the COVID-19. Equities would have fallen significantly in your portfolio, you know, in terms of value. Hence, you'd want to rebalance your portfolio, maybe moving out of asset class into other ones, because, again, you want to maintain a particular weightings. And when new money comes in, you have to ensure that, that money is allocated so for example if the equity my portfolio constructed between equities and fixed income to be 60 40 if somebody brings me new money i'm going to maintain that ratio i'm going to split the money 60 40 so that i can maintain that weighting somebody was asking the, asking me a question a while ago um can I repeat it please online Okay, so we're going to go into the we're going to go into that. The question was asked, how do we calculate the weighting? We're going to go into that when we go into the demonstration. But again, it's really to just get a feel. There's no strict science to how a portfolio is, is created. A lot of it comes from experience. You just need to know what the risk profile is. You need to be able to say, um, when I look at this portfolio, what risk profile would I assign to this portfolio? And truthfully, there's some um technology out there or models that are created that essentially you not know, does that for you so all right like i will again emphasize the barita roadmap it does that for you it practically tells you what portfolio weighting should be assigned between the different unit trusts and as the algorithms created based on how you answer questions so there's a bit of it is um human touch and um there's a part of it is an art while also there's a scientific part to it which are creating the portfolio but there's no there's no one size all fit answer it really depends on what you understand from the client and how you feel about the client in terms of their understanding of the market, their age, their situation, and you create that portfolio. Say, for example, if they're only looking for, if they're mainly looking for stream of income, you don't want to focus more on fixed income securities. That doesn't mean that you're not going to give them equities. It may give them dividend yielding equities. So those are the kind of things that really go into creating a portfolio. It has a lot to do with style and experience from the from the advisor and the investor. Because I mean, one. Um, client can come to two different persons and ask them to create the same portfolio. The portfolios may not necessarily look identical. Mm -hmm. They may have the same risk profile in terms of the portfolios, but again, there's no straight, straight out that says, if I'm conservative, I must have 50-50. No, that's not necessarily the case. And again, there's no rule that says that an um, aggressive person must have more equities in their portfolios than not cover. Again, example, equities could be 30 percent of the portfolio but then they buy high yielding bonds very risky bonds that in itself is aggressive so again I, just to emphasize there's no one size fit all to say this is how you create portfolios that's not really how it goes it has, has a lot to do with touch and feel 
but you have to stay within particular parameters. And again, you really should be guided by your company's um, ERM framework, which is the Enterprise Risk Management Framework. You should really seek guidance from your different advisors, your, um, your supervisor, when you're speaking about creating a portfolio. But over time with experience, you'd know what a conservative profile would look, especially for a person that has a specific goal in mind. Does that answer your question? Okay, so that, okay, so, so the question I was asked was is a very loaded question. I have a very, very good question though. So the question was asked, if a client comes to you and then say, I have investment portfolios at different investment houses, but I only want to use Barita for my equity portfolio, how do you then treat that person? That's a very good question. And again, that what that shows you is a very open client. That means that you would have asked them the questions on their questionnaire. So you'd have known what is their ability to take risk. Again, you'd have seen their full assets and liabilities. You'd have known that they have a portfolio over there. The portfolio is, is filled of these type of securities. And they say to you, they only want equities at Barita, then that is fine. Because at that point in time, your responsibility starts and ends with what you have at Barita, that conversation with Barita. Now, truthfully, portfolio should be looked at a holistic perspective. But to the extent that you're, you have no control of the makeup of the other person's portfolio, you cannot hold yourself liable to that. Your person came to you to add Barita and said, I want to only utilize Barita for equities. Then that is fine. But again, equities doesn't mean that you buy only lumber depots and um, I create, for example, on the junior market stock. You can still create a portfolio of equities, including the IPOs that may have capital growth fund, may have the FX bond fund, which is um, FX growth fund, sorry, which is US equities. You then can buy some local blue chip stocks while also buying some junior market stocks, which are growth stocks. Again, they already told that they want to only buy equities and they would have already showcased to you that they have an understanding of the market because they have different investment portfolios being managed by multiple um, brokerage houses, which again is really fine. And it's really that they are, this, or how you got the saying, I always said, they'll put all the eggs in one basket. So there's nothing wrong with that. But your responsibility starts and ends with the money that they have given you at Barita based on the goal that they've given you at Barita as well as the risk profiles that are assigned to them at Barita. Does that, um, answer your question no problem so back to the board a portfolio may or may not have all these components but the best portfolio will now a person may not necessarily be looking for cash generation i just want capital protection and cash, um, capital um, appreciation that's fine if the client tells you that you have to work with what the client wants but as an advisor you should really showcase to them why it's important to have at least all three of these themes governing their portfolio the best portfolio will have a little bit of troops of all three of these the type of assets that perform these functions are what determine the risk profile of the portfolio and not the function of the asset itself now it sounds like a mouthful and it sounds confusing but let me break it down the type of assets you have equities you have fixed income the, how these assets perform or the assets, the type of assets that perform these functions are what determines the risk profile. But is not the function, the, oh, sorry, where am I lost myself? The type of assets that perform these functions are what determine the risk profile of the portfolio and not the function of the asset itself. Again, equities can be bought by all persons across all risk profiles. Equity as an asset class is not a bad thing, right? Now, the individual assets, in terms of what the different risk in the individual assets will kind of determine what profile or portfolio, sorry, you'd actually put that asset in. Kind of would have been emphasized with the NCB and on the Lumber Depot. These are both equities, but they're not the same type of equities. Hence, the type of equities is really um, what determines the risk profile and not equities in general. So equities isn't bad. Type of equities you take determine the risk profile. If you're an NCB or a blue chip buyer, or you are a growth company, a high risk buyer. That is what determines your profile, not equity. And that kind of answers um, Chantel's question about a person. If they think conservative, can they then buy equities? The answer is yes, but be guided by your company's um, guidelines. But really and truly, yes, just the type of assets in that asset class you buy. That's what our second point is making. Again, it's a type of asset in terms of what equities you buy, not equities in general is bad. So again, here's a broken down example that I used. For example, a blue chip stock of a mature and industry leading company carries less risk than a stock of a startup company who's in infancy stage of the business cycle. These are the same asset types, 
but these are different risks. Again, same asset types, these are both equities, but they carry different risks. One would be for an aggressive investor, one considering probably Mail, Parkan, iCurie, Lumber Depot, those are some of the recent IPOs, versus somebody who wants to buy NCB, Sajor Core, JMB. They are all equities. They are the same asset type, but they carry different risks. Another example is a bond that's offered by an investment grade company versus a bond offered by a non investment grade company. Again, the asset type, which is fixed income, is the same. They are both fixed income securities, but they carry different risks. The last class we spoke about when we looked at um, different types of bonds, you know, non investment grade bonds would have a higher yield because they are riskier. Hence, um, compared to investment grade bonds that have a lower yield because they have less risk. Same asset classes, different risks. You can be aggressive and have bonds, but the type of bonds you buy determines the risk profile, the type, not the asset class itself. You can be conservative and still buy a bond. The type of bond you buy determines the risk profile, not the asset class itself. Um, I'm making myself clear online, guys. I want to make sure that this is clearly brought across that is the type of asset that you buy and not the asset class itself that determines the risk profile. Everybody's clear online? Okay, so the question was asked, if somebody has a broke, has an account elsewhere, and they are considered to be conservative based on how they did their, assuming they did their questionnaire, and they come to Barita and they say that they're high risk profile, how do you then, you know, determine the, how you then determine the risk profile of the person who they asked? Okay, so, okay, so the, the scenario that was given is that they have $20 million elsewhere that is on conservative, and they have a million here that they want to put on something aggressive. The question is then, what is their risk profile? No, the risk, the portfolio does not determine the risk profile. The person determines the risk profile. And if you go back to the, if you're looking at these themes, not because the person has conservative, and I'm assuming you mean conservative based on the type of assets, that does not necessarily mean that they are a conservative person, it just means that that is how they decided to allocate that 20%. Again, the first question was asked about the different portfolios at different brokerage houses. That individual would have looked at their portfolio holistically, seeing that they have money at these different brokerage houses to kind of determine their internal weighting. You at Barita, you may not have that luxury or that privilege to see how an entire portfolio is constructed for an individual. But when that person comes to you, you're going to ask them the list of questions. Now, those list of questions are what's going to determine the person's risk profile, not the amount of money that they have and bring to you, or what them tell you that they are, the questionnaire is what guides the risk profiles assigned to the person. So it's less about what they say they have elsewhere, especially if they can't verify it, or even if they do show you, you know, that is not what determines the risk profile. The risk profile is strictly based on a set of questions that you ask a person and they get a score and it's assigned to that person. And then at that point in time, you allocate the money that they bring to you based off that. So it's not about the amount of money. Somebody bringing a hundred dollars, a million dollars, ten million dollars, they can all be conservative. The value of the money that they bring to invest with you does not determine the risk profile. The question that you ask to get an idea of their actual situation, their willingness and ability, that is what determines their risk profile. Does that answer your question? Okay, so the question the question was um the question was um reconstituted to say can we then look at the fact that the person has $20 million at, on a conservative product at another company? Would it then in, um, imply that them coming here, they're also conservative, even though they want to invest in an aggressive? I'm assuming that's what they're asking in, in layman's term, right, Monique? Okay, then again, the answer I give you is the same. The questionnaire that they answer at Barita determines that risk profile. Because you do not know what kind of um, measures or metrics they utilize at other brokerage how to determine a risk profile. They could probably have um, assigned the wrong risk profile to the person over there. You can't hold yourself responsible responsible for that. You have to work within the guidelines stipulated by Barita. Hence, when you ask those questions, you have to then determine, okay, based on this questionnaire that you have done, based on what I need to find out from you, from the KYC process to the risk profile process, this is their risk profile. If the risk profile comes out to be conservative, then again, there's nothing wrong with being conservative. And especially when you're considering all the three themes, it's just that you're going to weight it differently. 
See, even if they bring their million dollars, because they are signed conservative, they may actually be able to weight these different themes differently. Also, they could have come to Barito, completed the form, done our internal process, and actually got assigned an aggressive risk profile. At that point in time, all, it, all that changes is the weighting of these three themes. Nothing changes else other than that than the weighting, because you're going to still buy the type of securities or the different you can still buy different types of securities and the weights are what's going to change and based on the different goals of the person. But again, you can't look at another person's portfolio at another brokerage house to determine what profile, portfolio, or profile you should assign to them at your own brokerage house. Again, these are independent questions you have to ask. You have to fill out the questionnaires. You would internally determine the risk profile of that person. Cool, man? All right, cool. So the next stage, when we're speaking about construction of a portfolio, there is a, there's a sort of a stepping stone or process to it, you know? But I, again, I made a point earlier, there's no right or wrong way to do it. These are not all the steps. You probably can take out some, but these are generally to create the best portfolio. These are the five steps that we ideally want to say, you need to do these five things when you're creating a portfolio, right? One, you have to determine the risk profile at the onset of any conversation. You need to determine the risk profile. Then you do your asset selection. What assets am I going to buy? Am I going to buy the blue chip stock or am I going to buy a startup stock? I determine my asset selection. I then determine my asset weighting. Is this person saving for graduation? Is this person saving for retirement? Is this person saving for vacation? Are they saving for um, university? What is this money for? That then determines my weighting. Are they looking to draw down money, money on it on a monthly basis? Are you looking for the portfolio to fund itself? Those are the things that go into determining the asset weighting for the um, portfolio. Then you implement the portfolio, you buy up the securities, you create your weightings, and you, you look at your portfolio and say, all right, this is your portfolio, and you give them their monthly statements, right? Then the last and important step is reevaluate and reassessing the portfolio. I should have actually put rebalancing there as well because the point was made earlier when a particular asset may be growing or falling down compared to where it should be weighted, you then want to reapply it or reapply new monies towards it to make sure that the weighting remains correct. So when you speak about determining risk profile, you properly assess the willingness and ability of the portfolio owner. This is Hans portfolio, Sean's portfolio, Chantel portfolio, um, Barita's portfolio, John Brown portfolio. These are the portfolio owner. That is their portfolio. Hence why it's important that they understand that person's willingness and ability. The asset selection is sure that the recommended assets fit the functions of the portfolio and the risk profile. If I'm aggressive, I'm going to buy a startup company. If I'm conservative, I'm going to buy a, um, blue chip company if i'm in between then at that point in time you know you kind of get into it a little bit more you ask the person how do they feel about this company do they know anything about this company that is how you kind of determine it for the persons who are in between us but again you ensure that the recommended assets fit the functions of the portfolio and the risk profile then determining the asset weighting assets should be weighted based on the objective of the portfolio are they creating a retirement fund or an emergency fund Different between the two, retirement fund, you're looking for cash flows. Emergency fund, you're looking for capital protection, right? So this, that's how you determine what type of asset weight you're looking for. You need to know what function of this money serves. Somebody come to you and say, yo, it's $10 million here. What do you want to do with this money? How would you like this money to be used? What do you plan to do with this money? How soon do you want to see it? Is it a five-year horizon, 10-year horizon, 20-year horizon? You need to know these things, and that is what determines your asset weighting. Then you implement the portfolio. So you ensure that the portfolio owner understands the portfolio construct, meaning that what you have selected in terms of asset and what you have determined in terms of asset weighting is fully communicated to that client and they then sign off on this constructed portfolio. The sign and say, again, documentation is very important. I'm signing to say, I understand what is in this portfolio and this is aligned with what I want to do. We explain to them what the portfolio is going to do, how it's, going to, uh, how it's potentially going to perform. There's no guarantee to any performance of any portfolio and, and past performance does not guarantee future performance, but they would have understand that this is the possible um, return that I could get out of my portfolio based on you know any determining metrics you would have used.
And then finally, when you reevaluate and reassess your portfolio, you ensure a timely reporting of the portfolio performance are made and adequate adjustments where necessary are done to meet the goals and objectives. Right? So you want to ensure that you always constantly check in the portfolio every month you send up. I send an um, update. This is how your portfolio performed last month. You know, how you feel about it. You want to change it or anything like that. You communicate with the client. You know, they said that the one that the one they report like every year at that point in time, so the year that maintained and you have watched the portfolio, the advice and say, all right, the portfolio is not, is the weightings have changed a bit due to whatever functionality. You're going to go in, then go into call the client and say, hey, the portfolio along the way, this happened. Um, these assets moved down, these assets moved up, so we're going to do some re rebalancing essentially. And you're going to ensure that the asset owner or the portfolio owner understands what is happening with their portfolio. It's a constant communication. And the more portfolios you handle it, you will feel like more work, but it really and truly won't because you will be familiar with the different owners of the portfolio and then you'll eventually know what needs to be done to ensure the portfolio maintains its correct objective at all times and within the current risk profile based on what the risk profile of the owner is. Is there any questions on this slide? No? All right. I think, yeah, we're going to the live demonstration now. So we're actually going to build a portfolio at this point in time based on two individuals characteristics. So just like last class, I built a little story about a person and we're going to then determine what is the objective of the person. You know, we're going to determine what kind of portfolio we're going to give them. We're going to actually determine what is the risk profile of this person. And then we're going to select collectively what, prof what portfolio you're going to give this person. Right? So character A. Individual A recently graduated from university and they, as they are currently 25 with a first class honors in business management. They want to pursue a postgraduate degree but currently they are not financially able. They took a student loan to pursue their bachelor's, which they have to start repaying after two years of graduating. They currently live alone, but they are a first generation university graduate for their family. As such, they are providing financial support to their parents. They are fortunate to have been successful to obtain a job right out of university that pays them about US 90,000 per annum. The annual expenses is approximately 49 um thousand forty five thousand sorry and they, su they support their parents with ten thousand their annual student loan payment is going to be twenty thousand for five years they're seeking to create they're seeking to create a portfolio that will allow them to register for university and they are starting with a balance of us ten thousand so they're giving you us ten thousand right they have made um they are they have moderate knowledge about the market but want to ensure they have enough money to start university within the next three years. At the onset of this, what would you classify this person's risk profile to be? Anybody online, what would you say this person's risk profile is? There's no right or wrong answer. It's just our idea, I want to be able to see how a guy they're thinking. What would you classify this person's risk profile to be? Moderate to conservative, all right, any other answers? I mean, my biggest question is where is Moderate. he working at 30 million Jamaica? They're assuming that's his job. It's his US dollars and they assume that it's Jamaica. We never say you. No, but he says, but again, we're putting, making 30 million Jamaica a year. <laughs> Sean is concerned about this person's money. <laughs> what are they, what they doing to earn this money? 30 so million. So they wouldn't pass Sean's KYC for him, clearly. No, no. <laughs> He okay. Say, um, it's, a, um, it's a year, mostly. 90,000 per, per annum. Per, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 13 million a year. It's still good. <laughs> I don't earn 13 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one person made a point that they, they, they may have the potential, the willingness to be aggressive, but he doesn't, they sh they're not sure if they have the ability to be aggressive, right? And that's a good point. Okay, and one person was saying that's why it's moderate. All right, so let's look at let's look at individual um, individual B, right? Also, when you look at equities, is it usually that um, they are long term kind of? Chantel. because like companies take a while to. Okay, so Chantel was asking the question: Are equities generally should be looked at as long term? And the answer is yes. At no point in time should somebody be buying an equity because they want they want to sell it tomorrow. 
then want to sell it next month. That is not the that's not the profile. That's not the um the pro the function of equities. Right. You're buying a stake in a company, and I believe that more people viewed equities that way they treat it differently you're buying a stake in a company you're an owner of this company so you're not gonna sell your company tomorrow or next month you know you want to grow with that company because you believe in the company hence why you bought it in the first place cool all right so that was that was Ashanta's question and again i um just emphasize she was asking the question you know the risk profile of um equities is really for long-term investing that really should be done. Long term can vary between, you know, five years, 10 years going onward. But really and truly, you want to ensure that you're invested for a long investment horizon. Now, individual B is 50 and has been a middle manager for the majority of their career, earning an average US for 400,000 for approximately 20 years. On average, meaning that them start out and know where them did, Sean. Sean is very concerned about my figures. <laughs> they currently have two children, one about work. to start university abroad and the other entering high school. They have two properties that they use as rental properties earning approximately 150 per annum US. The combined mortgage of the properties is 75 per annum with an average weighted life of 10 years remaining. Their expenses is roughly US 10,000 per annum and this does not include the cost of university. They are contemplating early retirement, which is five years from now, but is willing to wait until the second child reaches university, which is seven years from now. They have no, not, they have low knowledge of the market and want to ensure that there is enough money in their portfolio to pay for the second child university and repay the loans of the mortgage without requiring to utilize their pension. So what risk profile would you get assigned to individual B? Chance is conservative. What do you guys think online? It is conservative. The returns that they're going to get on it aren't going to be enough to pay for the second child's university. It's pen and paper that I'm just here. Somebody writing. That's good. That's good. That's good. Somebody is writing. That's good. No, man, this one, this one caused serious debate. Everybody, I try to think about it. Um, any other answers online? Okay, so, so, okay, okay, so, um, so, so Russia, Russia, Russia was making the point that you know, based on the, based on the fact the person is looking for um capital protection. That's why you said money looking for capital protection or cash generation. Okay, so you're saying that because the person looking for cash generation, they may be um, high risk in terms of um, looking, they may be aggressive. That's why you said money, run, run, rush, mixing up the names. Rush, that's why you said right, rush. Because the person looking for cash generation, they may be more aggressive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so um Russia was making the point that you know to actually afford bonds in quotation as an asset class to maybe afford the mortgage, you know, they may need may they may need to buy high risk bonds, hence they may be more moderate aggressive. No, Rush, that approach is, a, is you're, working, you're working in the reverse. It shouldn't be the asset class that determines the person's risk profile. You should determine the risk profile and then determine what assets you purchase for the person to meet their goal. So it shouldn't be based on, okay, they may need this amount of money to, per, to cover this amount of um, mortgage per se that determine the risk profile. It should determine the risk profile at the onset and then determine what assets. If you remember the five steps to creating the asset, the very first thing that you do must, must be determine the risk profile. And then the second step is asset allocation. So, and then from there, you determine the um, portfolio weighting. So at, always at the onset, you should always determine the person's risk profile. Don't be too worried about what assets are out there they need to buy and stuff. That's why weighting matters. 
right? Because for example, if they purchase some equities and there's capital appreciation, they can literally skim off the capital appreciation by selling some of those securities when their value goes up. I use that to pay down the mortgage. Doesn't necessarily have to mean fixed income. So, I mean, those are some of the things that you can think about when you're considering like other avenues for cash generation for a portfolio. But I still like your response, Rush. That means that they're really thinking deep about it. But always determine the risk profile first before you actually go into the asset selection. I always think about the risk profile first, which is why I asked you what risk profile is, are these individuals? Cool. Mm -hmm. That's that's something I glad I realized nobody brought nobody brought up that point. The fact that the rental on the properties is more than enough to cover yeah. the mortgages. Yes. <laughs> it's more than enough to cover the mortgages. So again, and I'm glad they brought that up because Rush, yeah, I realized they kind of overlooked that. You know, you automatically saw mortgage payments and you kind of just, you know, you start thinking fixed income. And that's kind of, I didn't want to bring it up then I wanted to see if anybody would have noticed. Really and truly, you don't have to worry about the mortgage. The properties are taking care of itself. The properties are literally taking care of yourself. So that's a good eye that they have right there. I purposely built it that way so that I want to see who would have really picked up on the fact that the properties you really didn't need to worry about the mortgage so you're right they may have the capacity to be more aggressive than than moderate they may actually have that um they actually may have that potential right they're not that old either they have a little leeway with them <laughs> sorry okay okay yeah Oh, sorry, guys. Miss Miss Barkley came and visited us a bit. She came to say her hellos. Okay, so we have read the different characteristics for the individuals. Um, we would have. A, oh, you have, you have a question, Sean? Yeah. But this one, mm -hmm. um, you didn't say, or the client didn't say how much they want to invest, um, like they want to start with them. So on. that's a good point. That's a good point. The so. Last part when saying that they want enough money in it to pay for the second chance university, they mm -hmm. want how much money they're putting in. In seven years' time, yeah. right. right? So, so Shantel was also making a point, which I think was aligned with um the last response I got a while ago. She was saying that the person, oh, I'm not seeing the name, Sherida. Sherida, oh, okay. So, um, Shantel is is along, oh, from the bank. Okay, nice to meet you, Sherida. Chantel was agreeing with your point to the extent that she said the person didn't indicate to us how much they plan to start with. But if they want to afford university in seven years time, you know, being conservative may not necessarily allow them to achieve that goal. So again, that kind of shows you that, you know, you have to take everything collectively into consideration when you're speaking about a person's risk profile. So I, I like that everybody's having different um ideas about it and again this is really as much as an art as it is a science there is no right or wrong way which is why it's important that each company has a enterprise risk pro a risk management um system in place say so it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it you know you'll be guided by your risk profile you essentially would have certain questions that you tick off one by one to say all right cool they meet this they meet that they don't meet this and then when a score is compiled they then are assigned a risk profile. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. We're doing it the old school style where you just look upon a person and say, yeah, man, my gear, this, I'm going to do that. But really and truly in the modern day, 2020, there are actually models that are done that takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. But still, you have to have a little bit of um, human interaction with it. So we're going to start off with um, individual A. So I already determined what the uh, objective of the portfolio is so that they kind of take the guesswork out of it for people. The portfolio objective is to have asset appreciation with capital protection. Now we need to determine what risk profile we're going to give this person because the risk profile is going to then determine what portfolio we here we then pick. For example, if we have our risk profile of aggressive, these are your potential portfolios. Your portfolio A, where 30% is capital protecting protection assets, 50% is capital appreciation, 20% is income generating, or portfolio B is 50% capital protection, 20% um, is cap income generating, or 30% is capital appreciating assets, or it could be portfolio C, where it's almost 70% 70 70 is capital protection, 20% is cap capital appreciating, and then 10% is cap income generating. So you need to ensure that we assign the appropriate... Is this aggressive? 
Hmm. Yeah, this don't look that aggressive to me, but <laughs> um, right. So you want to be able to determine the appropriate risk profile to assign the correct portfolio to the person. Yeah, so, the other way around. Yeah, I, I, I about, yeah, I'm looking conservative because that. The, no more way. This is very, this is very conservative. Okay. Yeah, this is conservative. Okay, it's so aggressive. I guess in light of COVID, nobody not really want to take on too much ag ag capital appreciation risk. So these are the portfolios. I mean, fifty percent is not bad. That's very high for portfolio yeah, yeah. A. I was surprised at thirty percent. Okay. So collectively, guys, what risk profile would we give the individual A? I can take two answers online. And then, you know, we're going to have a, a little brief discussion and determine what risk profile we assign to the person. There's a brief summary. They're 25. They have their parents to support. They're making 90000 for the year. Their expenses, excluding their parents, is 45. And then when you include their parents, it's an additional 10. They want to, they to start repaying their um, student loan in two years from now, uh, which is going to cost them an additional 25, I believe. Additional additional 20 per year for five years and then they are giving you ten thousand today to invest what risk profile would they give to this person i want two answers oh i have the portfolio objective which is asset appreciation with capital protection we got that objective from them so what proof what, what um risk profile would you assign to this person All right, moderate conservative. All right, one more answer. Pardon me? One more answer. People give an A, B, or C. No, well, no, picking a risk profile first. Oh. I always start with the risk profile. All right, it's, it's somebody for bump up, right? Yeah. Or is it aggressive? As in for the person, for individual A? Because, by the way, I mean, are we assuming that? He's not paying his student loan via his actual salary. We're assuming so. Because, uh, or is, are we hoping his investment will help to pay his student loan? That's a good question. And I didn't incorporate that, but um, that's a good question. Sean, Sean's making a good point. Is it that we expect the portfolio to pay for the student loan, or is it that, um, you know, the, the salary is going to pay for it? Um, but really and truly, the objective for the funds is really to get them into university for yeah. postgraduates. Yeah. That's really the objective. So that part of it, they would already know because they, okay. they didn't say that to us. Okay. They just want to have enough money to actually start university in three years time. Mm -hmm. So that is what we're working with. Because that's, this, that's what this portfolio is being made for. Have to be capital <laughs> like, if you want that in three years, you're only going to get it one week. Okay, so Sean, so we're working with, so we're going to work with moderate since that is what um, the consensus is. So we have three different distinct portfolios, right? We have portfolio A, which again, we have 50% being capital protection, 30% toward appreciating assets, and then 20% income generating. We also have portfolio B, which is 11% toward ap capital appreciation, 30% between capital protection, and then 56% toward income generating. I purposely did not use specific asset classes because I do not want to get to think along the lines of asset classes, because again, asset classes does not determine the risk profile. The specific assets does so i took that option away from you just so that you don't think along those lines you think along the align the three themes which should be aligned with the objective of the portfolio and then portfolio c we have income generating assets 20 percent 60 percent toward income generating 20 percent between capital appreciating assets and then 20 percent between capital protection which portfolio uh, would you get assigned to this client Assuming that he's a moderate risk profile. Give him C. Probably give him C. Okay, so Sean and Chantel says C. What anybody else thinking in the room online? What are you guys thinking? Remember, the goal is asset appreciation and capital protection. All right, so um, the consensus is portfolio A. Uh, I'm inclined to kind of agree with A on the basis that at this point in time, given, given their situation where they have at least two dependents on them, they have their parents that are dependent on them while also financing their normal expenses. And in two years time, they're going to have to start paying down towards um, their actual, um, what am I looking for? Student loan. 
So at that point in time, you know, that person, two years is not very far. So you don't want to risk that person losing any form of capital. So you want to really put towards um, capital protection assets, right? That means they're probably generating a little bit on it. But also you want to ensure that they have a decent amount of capital appreciate the assets to kind of pull the portfolio up with them while potentially generating enough income that they can probably put towards paying down the, um, the student loan if they decide to do it that way. They didn't say to us what they plan to do with it, but this is probably, I think, is closely aligned with the person's objective. And again, this does not mean how you should actually create a portfolio for the person. This is just three sample keys that I created just for the sake of this demonstration. You could actually have probably 40% capital protection, 40% towards um, capital appreciating, and then that the final 20 goes towards um, income generating. There's no guarantee, there's no fixed rule that says it has to be this or that. It's I just use this for the sake of the um, presentation. So consensus is portfolio A, and I'd be inclined to kind of agree with it um, based on the objective. So let's now look at portfolio client B. Client B is looking for capital protection with income generation. What risk profile are we assigning to client B? Just a reminder, client B, sorry, is, is a 50 year old, has two kids, one starting university, so them are right, but another one in the pipeline, seven years from now, wanting to join university. Uh, I can retire in five years, but she can also choose to elect to wait additional two years, which is seven years, which is until the child actually goes to university. She has two properties generating a collection, collective 150, while the collective mortgage on the pro property is also 75, which have a remaining life of 10 years. So, and she comes to us and says she wants us to have capital protection with income generation. What risk profile are we assigning to this person? Sorry, are you including the fact that she says she has no knowledge? Yes, you have to include, and Sean made the point, you have to include the fact that she says she has no knowledge or low knowledge, I believe it's low. It's low. Right, she thinks she says she has low knowledge of the market and want to ensure that there's enough money in their portfolio to pay for the second child's university and repay the loans of the mortgage without requiring the utilizer pension. So she has low knowledge of the market. What do you guys think her risk profile should be? No takers? You think moderate too? Moderately conservative. Moderately conservative, okay. Everybody, everybody, everybody are jumping on the middle and then put a toe upon one side. Everybody are trying to play it safe. I mean, she's how much she invests in, she didn't state how much yeah. she's investing, she didn't state. Okay, that's a good question. So, the question was asked Are we, uh, are, am I assuming that a person with a low knowledge of the market cannot be aggressive? That's a very good question. And a question in isolation, or, or that in isolation is not enough to determine a person's risk profile. You have to take everything into consideration. And I'm glad that you brought up that point because, really and truly, having Loan, low knowledge alone is not enough to justify, okay, they should not be aggressive. You have to look at everything in, 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 um, in completeness. For example, somebody could have low knowledge, but have the most money in the world, right? Are you going to tell the person not buy up some companies because, hey, you don't really know what you do? They have the capacity or the ability. And then willingness also means that they probably say they are willing to, to buy up some companies, but they probably have no lower knowledge. So to answer that question specifically, I probably say for lower knowledge, they probably rely on you a lot. But that alone does not say, okay, they cannot be aggressive. They probably rely on you to kind of guide them more often. They probably call you probably twice a day to know what go on versus somebody who knows what's happening. But if they have the willingness and ability, which is a composition of multiple things, then again, that's what should determine the risk profile, not one singular thing. So to answer that question directly, Mon, somebody who has low knowledge does not necessarily mean that they cannot be aggressive. Your aggressiveness or your conservatism or your moderate stance is a combination of willingness and ability, not just one item can knock you out completely. Again, remember this is a scoring mechanism that is weighted, is how you're scored that determines your risk profile. Cool? Wait, hold, hold, wait, hold, hold on, how we reach B? We're not, we're not picking person profile yet, how we reach B? We don't know what person be. We don't, we, don't, we don't know what the person be. Right, this here for set them up. 
committed and served the truth of Christ through this. The capital protection is a big So what, what profile we're going to moderate? Yes. Okay. What, why is it why is it Sean? No, I said her her age mm -hmm. and she is two things. She she her age. Mm -hmm. She wants to retire. Now for sure the rental property is a big deal because she's getting income from right. it. She will. So that is a part of her, of her new income. Right. But she wants to retire. Um, she also wants to pay for college as well. So for mm -hmm. me, there's a lot, there's a heavy thing of income generation that she going to want from this portfolio. portfolio. Okay. But she says capital protection. So for me, the truth is you could give you could give a conservative risk profile and then just adjust the portfolio, portfolio. okay accordingly so it's not like it's gonna be only mm -hmm. capital okay so i'm not sure everybody heard what sean was saying but sean was kind of breaking it down which is really what everybody should be doing whenever you're speaking about your clients i'm talking about realistic clients at this point you really want to break it down step by step so sean was making the point that okay she won't retire in five years she tired she won't retire but she has two rental properties, which really and truly, once she retires, will be her main source of income going forward. You know, the mortgage is only for 10 years, so that kind of brings her to age 60. Then seven years into that, you know, she'll have some kids. she one of her kids want to go to university. she want to be able to afford to pay for university once that kid actually starts. So he's just trying to break it down. So Sean is along the lines of conservative, you said? Yes, Sean, but I will put... I have been waiting on probably some other things. Okay, so Sean, so, so Sean is saying that he would def he'll put her as conservative, but he has to look at the portfolio weights to determine which one he'd pick, which is a right. very good approach. Because you really, at the end of the day, you know, you can have multiple portfolios for the different risk profiles. How you weight it is really what determines. That is the third step when you're talking about construction of a portfolio. Risk profile assignment. Speak about asset selection, which I kind of took away from you guys because, and again, talk about high yield bond, JAMA and all them something there. So I took that away from you guys. So we're just trying to figure out the, the weighting on the portfolio, which is what Sean is saying. So I'm going to be along the lines of conservative because I truly and truly, guys, the woman is retiring in five years, right? So, and what you need to be mindful of when somebody retires, that means that after this point in time, there's no more source of income for them. So you're moving from somebody who may have a lifestyle of um, living off 400,000, but now it's going to be living off something of 150, mm -hmm. right? That's a big gap between those two years, mm -hmm. those two figures, mm -hmm. right? She's going to have a kid going to university in seven years time. She's going to be retired at that point in time. So you can't then, and if you do the mismatch, one is the, the weight of the, the mortgage is 10 years. The child is seven years. That means there's at least three years in here where she will still have to pay the mortgage and send her kid to school for at least three years. So that's that big mismatch. Mm -hmm. And these are the small details that people you cannot overlook. Mm -hmm. There's a big mismatch between when the child starts university, which is three years, and when the mortgage ends. So she's no longer going to be earning 400000 She's going to be living on one fifty. Yes, her pension is probably an additional hundred. Fine. But there's a mismatch between when her mortgage needs to be paid off and when the child starts. So I would actually agree that this, this is probably a more conservative portfolio, right? I'm, I'm along that line. I understand why everybody else would have, everybody said aggressive. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's really just a, um, it's really an art to it. And again, I don't have to be right. You know, somebody else could have said and showed me why it could have been aggressive or moderate. Again, it's just really how you feel and why it's very important, again, to follow the risk guidelines of your corporate company. Again, you have to protect yourself. So I'm actually leaning towards conservative. Um, five years, I mean, mortgages up in 10, child starts in three. Um, you have to be going to school for at least three years. Most university programs are five years anyway. So, I mean, I actually go along the lines of conservative and she already told us she wants capital protection with income generation. So, after we determine our risk profile, which we agree is conservative, how are we going to assign this portfolio? Which one are we going to assign to her? Are we going to assign portfolio A that have 80% protection, 10% appreciation, and 10% income, or portfolio B, which is... 70% protection, 5% appreciation, 25% generating, or we now buy no farm appreciating asset, just gonna do strictly protection and income. Which portfolio are you guys picking? Hmm. Yes, a B? 
All right, one person says B. What are you guys thinking online? I'm thinking B. All right. Don't tell what you're thinking. I think B. I was thinking C at first, but. Does she have a spouse? No worry about her husband. She and her husband are a deal. <laughs> she <laughs> think about you with them. And she, and she won. <laughs> she think about you. She don't know what I'm going to think in the next five years about her. She will start. <laughs> mm -hmm. Independent woman. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? I get it. That's true. But you know, you have to work with the information she have. You know, she not tell you about her husband. Then you can't want um, type billing to fact um, into the model that okay, she may have a husband that doing X and Y. This is the scenario, this is the characteristic, this is what you got on paper of the person, and this is what you have to work with. Right? If she has a husband, that's all all the better, you know. But working on the assumption that you know the husband isn't in the picture, she wants to send her her, her last child to school, to university, these are your options. So what are you thinking? Um, okay, so Russia was asking a question, can we start her at a particular risk profile, for example, aggressive, because she's going to be working for at least another seven years. And then when you get closer to the seven years, we then move her along, bring her down the risk profile to conservative. I mean, honestly, I agree. I think that that makes sense. It can. She have some more years in her. You know, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you, can, you really could do that. That's a very good point. I never thought about that. But I mean, it's a reality. And that's... And that, even for even for like two years, you're right, and that is why this even even this example that I'm showing you guys now is why it's kind of important to showcase that there's no fixed way to create a portfolio. It's a part of it that is the art. You just have to know your person. Like I look pan and say, you know, say, hey, you bright, and probably I get a scholarship, and even if you worry about pay fee, that's another possibility out there as well. So yeah, it really comes down to actually knowing the person. All this point in time, you just know a person named B, that person named A, but in reality, you'd actually have a different kind of relationship with the person. So that approach does work, Russia. It could work. You know, so three years and you get them aggressive, then all right, we we'll move them down to moderate, you know, we we'll move them along the risk profile scale because she has the capacity and she has the willingness in this in the sense that she wants capital protection and income generation. And then finally, when she actually retire and she have the look of um, pension contributing to the income for the properties, you know, I can put it to conservative. There's nothing wrong with that. Persons move along the risk profile scale all the time. So there's nothing wrong with that. And that's a possible answer. And I thought about that because, again, it's kind of hard to model something like that. But that's a possibility. But in the case you couldn't rush it, which one would you pick? Since it's so smart. Which would you pick? If she's conservative. Just in case Russia wants buy Russia won't buy some stocks. Russia right, won't so Russia won't won go aggressive and she won't buy beer stocks. Russia is portfolio A. Straight appreciation, Russia says so she's not ramping. <laughs> <laughs> Russia is not a joke thing. Russia wanna make sure the youth them are right. So she wanna make sure so the portfolio set up in a this way. And again, you can move the portfolio along the um, risk profile scale, so there's nothing wrong with it. And uh, there's no, again, there's no right or wrong answers for this entire exercise. It's just, I want you guys' brain to kind of be working to kind of see what goes into creating a portfolio. You have to know your clients. You have to know their um, objective. You have to know their um, financial situation. And you have to like speak to them, right? And uh, uh, hey, Okay, so that's a good question. So Monique was asking, if we're on this screen, which is aggressive based on risk profile, are we to assume that all these um, portfolios are aggressive? The answer is yes, because again, it's the type of asset that you purchase that makes a portfolio aggressive and not the asset class that you buy. So we're going to assume that we're buying very high risk, capital appreciating assets, high risk capital protection assets. Sounds counterintuitive, but there, there's such a thing as high risk capital protection assets. And then we're going to buy high risk income generating assets. Mm -hmm. All these assets, all these portfolios are risk profile. And the answer is yes, man. They're all high risk profile portfolios mm -hmm. or aggressive portfolios. Cool? Yeah. So remember, guys, it's not the asset class that determines the risk profile of a portfolio. It's the type of assets that you buy that determine it, the individual assets. So I think we've all had, you know, a little brain teeth with this one. And again, there's no right or wrong answers. It's just really an exercise to show that you can moderate a portfolio based on different circumstances. And this would encapsulate all that we would have learned. You know, so this is the final stage of 
all that we'd have done in the masterclass, this introductory series. So we'd have talked about the different type of equities are, that are out there. We'd have talked about how to analyze a company, looking at the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement. We'd have looked at evaluating a company to determine which ones are aggressive, which ones are not aggressive. We'd have done that assessment to know which ones are mature, which ones are not mature. Then we looked at fixed income securities last time, looked at a different type of um, fixed income securities, looked at investment grade, non-investment grade, looked at wide margin spreads, looked at different credit ratings, looked at all those things. And then finally, taking all that we have learned so far, we said, all right, we're going to build a portfolio for a person based on their risk profile. So all of these things happen collectively, but you need, to, you need to ensure that you understand along the way that when you're creating a portfolio for a client but client comes to you and say i'm of 10 million dollars that don't mean nothing to you right mm -hmm. and you shouldn't necessarily call research and say guys this person has 10 million dollars that don't mean nothing to us we cannot do anything in isolation we need context we need to know the risk profile for the person give us some color give us some background speak to the client get this information from them right it's for two purposes one to protect yourself because you need to document what it is that they said and they sign off on the constructed portfolio as well as it allows you to know is the portfolio um um profile risk profile correctly matching the risk profile of the person these are two important aspects hence why sometimes you guys ask you know what should we do with the money we always respond and say yo we need to know what is it the person is looking to do what is it at the person um their situation we need to know these things and you need to know these things at the onset do not be afraid to ask your clients these questions. You need the answer to these questions to ensure that you are properly assigned the correct risk profile to them. So the, the question was asked in, um, you said the person, when they do the assessment, they actually come out to be a conservative and then they insist that they want to be aggressive or have an aggressive portfolio. How do you handle that? Um, that right there is a soft skill. You have to actually speak to your client, showcase to them why they didn't meet the aggressive risk profile because as again these are a models they're not done in isolation it would have literally shown you why maybe she can't afford to be aggressive the ability isn't there or maybe she has a lot of debt maybe she has too many dependents um maybe um he maybe he is not enough his source of income is not strong enough to afford to be an aggressive so you need to actually at this point in time you know as an advisor i would say have that conversation with a client, let them know why they did not get the risk profile that they're trying to get. And at that point in time, they push through and say, they want the aggressive. I believe that you'd have to take that up with your supervisor, you know, at that point in time, get the proper guidance. That would be my final, that would be my final advice on the matter, because, <laughs> right, you can get into document that they against advice that, you know, they want to use this portfolio. Those are some of the things, again, why we emphasize that you need to protect yourself and the company when you're making investment advice to persons right so these are some of the important things that we need to um, ensure at all times once you're on the front line you take these things into consideration and you speak to the uh, requisite clients and you speak to your advisors if it's a situation where you feel like you know you're not able to you're not getting through to the client or the client is being defiant you should escalate it to your advisor let them get involved let them know what is happening because you do not want to expose somebody to an um, investment product that then um you say it doesn't go how they want planned. They are going to say, Barita, let me do this. Barita, can't, let me do that. You can't afford to have your company's name and your name because they're going to call who their advisor is. You cannot have your name out of the road look like that. You need to protect yourself at all times. So again, the fine clients, they're not working out, you know, escalated to your supervisor. At that point in time, you know, they will give you the proper guidance on how to handle the situation. That would be my advice. You know, when a situation is there, you don't, you're not, you don't necessarily need to know it all. You have a team around you and you have your supervisor there to guide you speak to them you shouldn't be afraid to speak to your supervisor at any point in time especially when it comes down to clients who are going against advice that you believe is best suited for them right give you a protect idea of a high risk capital protection asset you want to buy like a private bond capital protected because it does not change value but the company come up out of nowhere in there, Africa, private bond out of Africa. You're not going to risk losing capital because, or it's capital protecting because there's no uh, mark to market of the security. So in that case, the, the, the capital is trading like it's trading like it's, um, it's not even trading at all. It's not trading at all. So there's no loss in your protection. You're just going to generate your coupon over the time, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still a risk. The company can go bust and you do lose everything. Hence why, you know, that risk is there. 
But that is just an example of a high risk capital protection asset, you know, private equity, not private equity, private um, credit bonds. Those are prime examples. You know, you have some companies that are very, very good in terms of um, risk rating. I mean, they're in the A region. Their capital protection as well, because they're still private, but they're lower on the risk scale. So if, for example, you want to buy, for example, a Portland bond, you know, it's, that's not really something you'd be concerned about versus buying an I create bond. Well, boy, huh. two different companies, two different risk profiles are assigned to those companies. Hence, their, their capital protection in terms of other features varies among those two companies. That answers your question, Mon. All right, cool. Any final questions before we wrap up for this evening? No? All right. Well, it was a pleasure, guys. These were just an introductory class. I believe HR is going to be involved soon to kind of speak to you guys about deepening the um the the knowledge with regards to these are just tip of the iceberg we really didn't get into much nitty-gritty of certain companies especially on a bond perspective um you didn't really get into like etfs and alternatives these are just surface level stuff and are supposed to be geared towards enabling you to have those conversations with clients it's really what we wanted to do to kind of fast track that process now when you're speaking to a client they can say hey this is your risk profile i'm thinking a portfolio should do this you know i wanted to buy this that and that because i want to ensure that you have income generating you want capital protection and capital appreciation and i promise you guys if you talk to your clients like that i'm gonna look amazing and say yo person you're serious about my money okay, i'm thinking about all the different scenarios and it's true and i've seen it before in, in terms of conversation with clients that they say yo this person really thinking about me they really understand what's happening they build this portfolio and the size of the money really shouldn't matter guys I see these weightings have no dollar figure beside it. These are different weightings. This could have been a million. Oops. This could have been a million. This could have been two million. This could have been hundred dollars. You have no idea. The weighting is what's important, not the nominal aspect of it. All right, guys. 